Hi, Dr. Robert. In today's video, I want to discuss the nervous system. The nervous system is responsible for every time you think, blink, eat, secrete, react to anything. It's because of the nervous system. The nervous system runs all the other systems in the body, the cardiovascular system, digestive system, reproductive system, hormonal system, etc., are all dependent on the nervous system. So it's the, the mineral system determines the healthy functioning of your nervous system. The fab four minerals of your nervous system is calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. More distinctly, it's the ratios. It's the sodium potassium ratio and the calcium magnesium ratio that determine if you have a balanced nervous system. So this is why when we're doing serial hair tissue analysis and mineral detoxification programs, we're always putting the spotlight on the NAK ratio and the calcium magnesium ratio because it's going to respond to the program. You start dumping a metal you know, that's going to cause irritation to the kidneys. That will cause sodium to go rogue. That will, you start dumping a metal that may also cause a sodium potassium inversion. You start dumping a metal that may kill calcium to go absolutely ballistic. So these are the changes that we see on a hair analysis. And we're always monitoring those two ratios because at the end of the day, it's those two ratios determine the health of your nervous system. When your nervous system is healthy, you won't be too high, you won't be too low. So it's always trying to achieve an optimal balance of the two most important ratios, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Now I'm gonna outline this on the whiteboard, so we're gonna take a look at it and we're gonna dig a little bit deeper. We know that the NAK ratio should be between 2.5 and 5. When that ratio goes low, that's going to be a very sluggish nervous system and that's going to be all of our chronic diseases. When that sodium potassium is low, you know, that's going to be chronic infections, that's going to be depression, that's going to be lethargy, that's going to be the inability to get up and go to do things. And it's going to set the table for the more insidious diseases such as our cancers and our real degenerative brain diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, etc. So the NAK ratio is truly called the life or death ratio because when that ratio is too low, you're setting the table for death. When that NAK ratio is also called the vitality ratio. When that ratio is in optimal firing, your, your vitality is wonderful. So the NAK ratio is also called the electrical ratio because these two monovalent ions, meaning they're in a plus one charge, where calcium and magnesium are in plus two charges. So the plus one charges are mostly responsible for setting the electrical grid of the body. Every cell at rest has a resting membrane potential. But we're gonna look at you know, uh, more the excitatory tissues such as muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, uh, all nerve tissue. Those are the excitatory tissues that absolutely depend on these channel proteins. So we're going to look at, you know, the four gates, these four channel proteins. We're going to look at the voltage gated channels and we're going to look at the voltage gated sodium channels. We're going to look at the voltage gated potassium channels. We're going to look at the ligand gated channel. So the ligand is going to be a ligand is can be a chemical such as an organophosphate that inhibit these ligand channels can be a pharmaceutical drug that they prescribe a drug to get a reaction to either inhibit or stimulate sodium or potassium from coming in um, and also a neurotransmitter so neurotransmitters is what we're going to look at in our example but just to know we also have leak channels we have the very important, and I mean extremely important, leaky potassium channels. We also have the leaky sodium channels, the leaky chloride channels, and the leaky calcium channels. I'm not going to get into that, but I just want to mention it because they are that important. 
We also have mechanically gated channels, which I'm not going to get into, but mechanically gated channels, you know, when you stub your toe, you know, or you put pressure on, you know, that's going to open up these mechanical gated channels that are responding to stretch, pain, temperature, you know, things of that nature. You know, stubbing the toe is the classic where sodium will go rogue. So sodium is that most volatile element on the table of elements. So I like to kind of think of sodium like the ocean. We, we know the oceans are loaded with sodium, you know, and, and so water and salt always go together. Sodium pulls water. So this is understanding how important sodium and potassium is for the whole balance of the fluids in the body. But we're kind of just putting the spotlight on the electrical component. So uh, sodium does not do not one enzymatic function in the body, but it does everything with the electrical gradient of the body. Potassium has a few other functions, but it's mostly an electrical ion. So these plus one charged ions are so important for the regulation of a nerve. So we're looking at a generic nerve, and on this picture I left out the dendrite, so we're looking at the cell body, the axon, and the terminal bulb. What we have studded into the nerve are these channel proteins, because ions just can't flow in. They have to go through a channel protein, because um, this is why we, we, we see that, you know, the... Uh, the cell membrane has a polar and a nonpolar part, and that's why it will it won't allow ions to come in. They have to go through these channel proteins, and so these channel proteins are instrumental when we're looking at health. We know from a genetic mutation point of view, they've done you know so many studies on the genetic mutations where cystic fibrosis is the classic channelopathy, where the chloride channel does not work. So if that chloride channel, look, the, the antiporter system in the chloride channel where chloride comes in, sodium leaves. So for sodium to leave, sodium leaves, chloride comes in, you know, it's, it's exchanging one for the other. That's called an antiport channel. So in cystic fibrosis where that chloride channel does not work because of a genetic mutation in the lung, that means that the sodium can't leave, the chloride can't get in, so the sodium stays in the lung. Remember, sodium draws water, so it brings the water, then we get the water mucus accumulation, which eventually will be the suffocation, the death of you, because of a malfunctioning genetic defect in the chloride channel, and that is cystic fibrosis. Diabetes is also a channelopathy. We also see in migraines and seizures and all these type of things where, you know, uh, the channels aren't working. And so in, in seizures where the muscle is contracting, but it can't relax because the calcium channel is being blocked. And so studded into these nerves, we have uh, the sodium voltage gated channels, the potassium voltage gated channels, the, the voltage gated calcium channels, and the ligand channels. And we also have, you know, embedded into these membranes are the sodium potassium pumps, which I didn't put in here, I just have it outlined here, but just know that these sodium potassium pumps can be embedded anywhere into these uh, nerves. So what happens in the firing of a nerve? So we're gonna look at it from a stimulatory point of view. So GABA is the most inhibitory nerve of the nervous system. Glutamate is the most excitatory nerve. So we're not gonna look at the GABA component, we're gonna look at the glutamate. Glutamate is responsible for at least 50% of all stimulatory effects on neurons. So another nerve is communicating to this nerve and it does it via the chemical, the neurotransmitter, glutamate. So glutamate is being released via the other nerve. So glutamate will come in and it will bind to this ligand channel and it will open the gate to allow sodium to come in. So that means sodium is coming into the cell bringing its plus one charge. Now, we have to look at the charge because on the inside of the cell, it's mostly negative. 
on the outside of the cell is mostly positive. Now, if you took a voltmeter and put it slightly on the inside, slightly on the outside, you would see that at rest, the resting membrane potential is negative 70 on the inside of the cell. So it's more negative on the inside, even though you got positive potassium and you got positive sodium in there, you got po you know, positive magnesium and positive calcium in there, but what makes it negative inside are the anions, the proteins and the phosphates. Those, because they're too big to leave, you know, to, to leave the cell. So the, the anions are in there. That's why this is going to be more negative at rest. So just to make a mental note that you got, you know, you got sodium mostly on extracellular, but you also got sodium inside, but it's the concentration gradient where the concentration gradient is more sodium outside, more potassium inside. And so this is what's going to, you know, cause an action potential that's going to make this cell become more positive. So we talked about the stimulatory neurotransmitter glutamate that was secreted via another nerve that hit this ligand gated channel. So glutamate binds, opens up the gate, sodium comes in. Then this will happen with another uh, ligand where the glutamate binds here opens the door sodium comes in and this will happen many a times to bring that sodium in with its plus one charge to eventually to hit that magic number we call threshold is negative 55. when we hit threshold at negative 55 something amazing happens negative 55 is going to influence the voltage gated sodium channels so at negative 55 the volt being the electrical component to this opens up the voltage gated sodium channel so then sodium is going to flood in so as sodium floods in because we're at that magic number 55 we went from negative 70 to negative 55 that sodium floods in as sodium floods in it brings its positive plus one charge making the inside of the cell more positive okay so we went from negative to positive with the influx of sodium coming in from the ligand channels the sodium made it allowed it to the cell body to reach threshold negative 55 negative 55 was the button that opened up the voltage gated sodium channels that allowed sodium to flood in as sodium flood in it brings in its plus one charge making the inside of the cell more positive so what has happened we've gone from negative 70 at rest we hit threshold at 55 then at 55 that caused this to spike and this is all because of sodium is coming in and this is the depolarization then the the repolarization is when potassium leaves so at positive 30, another magic number, two things happen at positive 30. So right around positive 30, that closes the sodium gates. So now sodium is stuck inside the cell. So all the sodium that came in, flooded in, and now at positive 30, that's going to open up the voltage-gated potassium channels where potassium is going to leave the cell. So we're going to see potassium leaving the cell and then again bringing with it its plus one charge. And with that plus one charge leaving the cell, it's going to make it more negative inside again. But, however, we have more sodium on the on the uh, inside and more potassium on the outside. It was just the opposite of where we started. So we're going to have to deal to reset that. We're going to talk about these pumps, but we'll get to the pumps to reset this. But just so we get the big picture, resting membrane potential at negative 70. We hit threshold at negative 55. That spiked us all the way up to positive 30. At positive 30, that shut the voltage gated sodium channels opened up the potassium gated voltage channels and then we went into hyperpolarization and no, we went into repolarization and then this will usually overshoot and go into hyperpolarization and then it will reset back to the negative 70 and then it will start this thing all over again 
every second of every minute of your life. So at positive 30, we mentioned how the potassium comes out, but also at positive 30, something else is going on. So that action potential came down the axon to stimulate these vesicles. In these vesicles at the terminal bulb of a neuron contain neurotransmitters. So each vesicle contains different neurotransmitters. It could be GABA, it could be acetylcholine, it could be dopamine, it could be serotonin, it could be adrenaline, it could be any uh, neurotransmitter. So then at positive 30, that opens, that triggers the voltage gated calcium channels. So the calcium floods in. As the calcium floods in, that causes this vesicle to fuse to the cell membrane to release its neurotransmitter. Now, that neurotransmitter, whatever it is, it's going to have, it's going to bind to the receptor for that particular neurotransmitter to have an effect on either another nerve or an end organ, such as a heart cell or a muscle cell or a smooth muscle or whatever. But the neurotransmitter, depending on which neurotransmitter is being released and how it binds to this receptor, will either have an inhibitory or stimulatory effect on the next nerve. But it's the calcium is the impetus that causes the release of the neurotransmitter. That's why I say that calcium magnesium isn't just the blood sugar ratio, it is the chemical ratio. We refer it to as the blood sugar ratio because you need calcium to release the insulin and then you need the magnesium to modulate the ionic balance of the release. So, cal so magnesium is kind of putting the brakes on the release of insulin. So calcium magnesium is the chemical ratio all it is the blood sugar ratio but more importantly it's the chemical ratio so at plus 30 the calcium floods in to release the neurotransmitter now if the calcium stays in the cell just think of the implications of the calcium staying in a heart cell so the calcium is going to cause the contraction and what happens if calcium keeps staying in it's going to cause a contraction eventually causing arrhythmias and heart attacks and things of that nature so we got to be able to remove the calcium and this is where we have the calcium pumps these calcium pumps are atp driven meaning it needs an energy source so when we talked about sodium going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration sodium going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration potassium going from a higher concentration on the inside of the cell going to a lower concentration when you go from a high concentration to a low concentration you're going downhill so you don't need an energy source in this instance the calcium that's coming in needs an energy source to pump it out because if we don't get the calcium out it's going to be detrimental to any cell so we got to make sure what that we get the calcium out so we have uh, an active transport and any active transport means it needs ATP we're more when we have a facilitated diffusion here doesn't need an energy source but here it needs an energy source but the highlight of ATP must have a magnesium molecule bound to the ATP or the ATP is useless. So this is the importance of that calcium magnesium ratio to make sure that the ionic balance of calcium magnesium is regulated to make sure that the magnesium is running these pumps to remove the calcium. So then the calcium, if it's in a muscle cell, can go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But you got to have an energy source. Like in a muscle cell, it's using an antiport system, you know, where it's uh, where calcium is piggybacking off of the sodium. And so the calcium is leaving, the sodium is coming in. But to have that sodium gradient, you need these pumps to make sure that that sodium gradient is corrected. And that's where we see how important the magnesium component is. Because again, we need an energy source. You must have magnesium. Now also another note to make on this picture, wherever you see these vesicles that contain neurotransmitters, to make a neurotransmitter requires glucose utilization. Glucose utilization, where we take a glucose, convert it into ATP, that's 22 steps. 
12 out of those 22 steps require magnesium. So we need, we'll, we'll, you'll see in the vesicle area of the terminal bulb, you'll always see a lot of mitochondria, and these mitochondria are helping to fuel and to make these neurotransmitters. But remember, magnesium runs the mitochondria in glucose utilization. So there's another need for magnesium. Now we're going to look at the sodium potassium pumps, the NAK pumps, the AT PACE. So these are the same things, but embedded into these things, we have these sodium potassium pumps. And these sodium potassium pumps reset this. So we see that the concentration, excuse me, the concentration gradient where potassium is now on the outside, sodium is now on the inside. So we have to reset that because we got to throw three sodiums out and bring two potassiums in. So these sodium potassium pumps are ATP driven because they're, they're swimming uphill, they're going against the grain. So we're trying to get this sodium back to its higher concentration on the outside of the cell and we're trying to get this potassium back inside the cell. And so to do that we need these pumps. These pumps are so important, and these NAK pumps, 50% of all the energy your body produces goes just to running these pumps. But these pumps are ATP driven, meaning you must have a magnesium bound to it. So you need magnesium to run this pump, you need magnesium to help evict the calcium, you need the magnesium to set the calcium magnesium ionic balance, you need the magnesium to make the neurotransmitter. Hence the importance of the calcium magnesium ratio. So the electrical chemicals, remember, we have a chemical stimuli, then we have an electrical stimuli, then we have a chemical stimuli, then we're gonna have another electrical stimuli. So this is how the sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium ratios work in regards to how a cell neuron fires. So to recap, resting membrane potential, negative 70, sodium comes in, causes the wave of depolarization, potassium comes out of the cell, causing the repolarization of the cell. Usually the sodium channels are a little bit slower, so it will usually hyperpolarize. That's where it will go to negative 90, and then it will reset. So this is the basic gist of it. Neurophysiology is very complicated, so I'm giving you a more of a Reader's Digest version, a Cliff Note version of what's going on. But the big picture is sodium potassium. This is why that sodium potassium ratio is critical. Calcium magnesium, that's why this ratio is so critical. So when we're doing our mineral balancing and we're looking at serial hair tissue analysis, we gotta understand fixing these ratios does not happen overnight. So this is why we keep always having our eye on these ratios so we're prescribing minerals when sodium is high we need that zinc and magnesium to bring that sodium down you know so this is why we're not doing replacement therapy low potassium give uh, potassium your low potassium may be because the sodium potassium pumps aren't working because you have a magnesium deficiency that's something i want you to think about because we're always I always hear, I got low potassium, low potassium, I need to eat 5,000 milligrams of potassium a day, I got to supplement with potassium, and yet, next test, next test, next test, low potassium, low potassium. We must address this magnesium. Magnesium is the quarterback of the mineral matrix. It runs this entire show. Magnesium is the magnetic spark of the sun bringing light to everything. So even when we die, we go into rigor mortis because all the calcium channels are released because the sodium potassium, the electrical charge is no longer there. And then magnesium is no longer there to modulate calcium. So all the calcium channels are being released and that causes the full blown contracture that we call rigor mortis, that we call death because the spark like magnesium and the electrical currents of sodium potassium are no longer there. So if you have any questions, thoughts or concerns, 
about any of this, whether we're talking about these pumps, whether we're talking about these ratios, whether we're talking about a generic nerve and the wave of depolarization, repolarization, or the ATP pumps, just leave a question and I will get back to you. And again, thank you for watching. Being with a friend, I